distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My paper is Religious Freedom, the Path to Peace. Religious Freedom. I would like to start my keynote address with a presentation of Pope's Benedict XVI message for the World Day of Peace in the year 2012, whose topic was precisely religious freedom, path to peace. I would like you to summarize first what Pope Benedict means for religious freedom and peace, and then in a second time to speak about some possible paths of peace promoted by religious freedom. First of all, according to Benedict XVI, religious freedom is an essential good. Each person must be able freely to exercise the right to profess and manifest individually or in community his or her own religion or faith, in public and in private, in teaching, in practice, in publications, in worship, and in ritual observances. There should be no obstacles should he or she eventually wish to belong to another religion or profess none at all. In this context, international law is a model and an essential point of reference for states insofar as it allows no derogation from religious freedom as long as the just requirements of public order are observed. International order thus recognizes that rights of religious nature have the same status as the right of life and to personal freedom, as proof of the fact that they belong to the essential core of human rights, to those universal and natural rights which human law can never deny. Religious freedom is not the exclusive patrimony of believers, but of the whole family of the Earth peoples. It is an essential element of a constitutional state. It cannot be denied without at the same time encroaching on all fundamental rights and freedoms, since it is their synthesis and keystone. It is the litmus test for the respect of all the other human rights. While it favors the exercise of our most specifically human faculties, it creates the necessary premises for the attainment of an in integral development which concerns the whole of the person in every single dimension. Religious freedom, like every freedom, proceeds from the personal sphere and it is achieved in relationship with others. Freedom without a relationship is not full of freedom. Religious freedom is not limited to the individual dimension alone, but it attains within one's community and in society in a way consistent with the relation being of the person and the public nature of religion. A relationship is a decisive component in religious freedom, which impels the community of the believers to practice solidarity for the common good. In this communitarian dimension, each person remains unique and unrepeatable, while at the same time finding completion and full realization. The contribution of religious communities to societies is undeniable. Numerous charitable and cultural institutions testify to the constructive role played by believers in the life of society. More important still is religion's ethical contribution in the political sphere. Religion should not be marginalized or prohibited, but seen as making an effective contribution to the promotion of the common good. In this context, mention should be made 
of the religious dimension of culture built up over centuries thanks to the social and especially ethical contributions of religion. This dimension is in no way discriminatory towards those who do not share its beliefs, but instead reinforces social cohesion, integration, and solidarity. The public space which the international community makes available for the religions and their proposal of what constitutes a good life helps to create a measure of agreement about truth and goodness and a moral consensus. Both of these are fundamental to a just and peaceful coexistence. The leaders of the great religions, thanks to their position, their influence and their authority in their respective communities are the first ones called to mutual respect and dialogue. Now pass to peace. Once we have exposed the concept of religious freedom, according to Pope Benedict XVI, let us now review some possible paths to peace. I would like you to start with a quotation of St. Augustine. He says, Ambula per hominem et pervenies ad Deum. Walk through men and you will come to God. We can transform this quotation and say, Ambula per Deum et pervenies ad hominem. Walk with God and you will come to me. In other words, we can say that there is a deep relation between humanism and religion, between human life and religious life, between what is authentically human and what is authentically religious. Who has a great idea of God has a great idea of man and vice versa, who has a small idea of God, has a small idea of man. There is a deep reciprocity between man's respect and God's respect. Human person's dignity. Starting from these considerations, the first path to peace is the implementation of human dignity. The right to religious freedom is rooted in the very dignity of the human person whose transcendent nature must not be ignored or overlooked. God created man and woman in his own image and likeness. For this reason, each person is endowed with a sacred right to a full life, also from a spiritual standpoint. Without the acknowledgement of, the, of his spiritual being, without openness to the transcendent, the human person withdraws within himself, fails to find answers to the heart's deepest questions about life's meaning, fails to appropriate lasting ethical values and principles, and fails even to experience authentic freedom and to build a just society. It could be said that among the fundamental rights and freedoms rooted in the dignity of the person, religious freedom enjoys a special status. When religious freedom is acknowledged, the dignity of a human person is respected at its root and the ethos and institutions of peoples are strengthened. On the other hand, whenever religious freedom is denied and attempts are made to hinder people from professing their religion or faith and living accordingly, human dignity is offended with a resulting threat to justice and peace, which are grounded in that right social order established in the light of supreme truth and supreme goodness. Moral freedom. 
A second path could be moral freedom. Religious freedom is at the origin of moral freedom, openness to truth and perfect goodness, openness to God is rooted in human nature. It confers full dignity on each individual and is the guarantee of full mutual respect between persons. Religious freedom should be understood then, not merely as immunity from question, but even more fundamentally as an ability to order one's own choices in accordance with truth. Freedom and respect are inseparable. Indeed, in exercising their rights, individuals and social groups are bound by the moral law to have regard for the rights of others, their own duties to others and the common good of all. A freedom which is hostile or indifferent to God becomes self-negating and does not guarantee full respect for others. A will which believes itself radically incapable of seeking truth and goodness has no objective reasons or motives for acting save those imposed by its fleeting and contingent interests. It does not have an identity to safeguard and build up through really free and conscious decisions. As a result, it cannot demand respect from other wills, which are themselves detached from their own deep being and thus capable of imposing other reasons, or for that matter, no reason at all. The illusion that moral relativism provides the key for peaceful coexistence is actually the origin of divisions and the denial of the dignity of human beings. Hence, we can see that need for recognition of a twofold dimension within the unity of the human person, a religious dimension and a social dimension. In this regard, it is unconceivable that believers should have to suppress a part of themselves, their faith, in order to active citizens, to be active citizens. It should never be necessary to deny God in order to enjoy one's rights. Family, the school of freedom and peace. A third path to peace is the family, a school of freedom. If religious freedom is the path to peace, religious education is the highway which leads new generations to see others as their brothers and sisters with whom they are called to journey and work together so that all will feel that they are living members of the one human family from which no one is to be excluded. The family founded on marriage is the expression of the close union and complementary between a man and a woman finds its place here as the first school for the social, cultural, moral, and spiritual formation and growth of children who should always be able to see in their father and mother the first witnesses of a life directed to the pursuit of truth and the love of a God. Parents must be always free to transmit to their children, responsibly and without constraints, their heritage of faith, values, and culture. Family, the first cell of human society, remains the primary training ground for harmonious relations at every level of coexistence, human, national, and international. Wisdom suggests that this is the road to building a strong, a strong and fraternal social fabric in which young people can be prepared to assume 
their proper responsibility in life, in a free society, and in a spirit of understanding and peace. Earth defense. A fourth and special path to peace is the defense of the Earth. The defense of Earth has produced and continues to produce very sharp conflicts. This happens all over the world, but especially in the Middle East and above all in the Palestine. But if from the possession of the Earth man goes to the common commitment to defend it, a great step toward peace is achieved. The Council of Religious Institutions of the Holy Land recently endorsed a Holy Land Declaration on Climate Change. The three members of the Council, his beatitude for the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, High Salat Zueika, Deputy Minister of the Palestinian Authorities, Ministry of Religious Affairs, Rabbi David Rosen, AEC International Director of Interreligious Affairs, shared their faith perspective on environmental preservation and climate change. We acknowledge, they said, the scientific basis of human-caused climate change and the threat it poses to human societies and the planet as articulated by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We also recognize the spiritual roots of this crisis and the importance of a religious response to it. We call on adherents of our faith in the Holy Land and all over the world to address the, this crisis by undertaking a deep reassessment of our spiritual and physical relationship to this God-given planet and how we consume, use, and dispose of its blessed resources. We also call for all people of faith to reduce their personal emissions of greenhouse gases and to urge their political leaders to adopt strong, binding, science-based targets for the reduction of greenhouse gases in order to avert the worst dangers of climate crisis. We hope that this threat to our common home of the Holy Land and of planet Earth will move religious adherents to overcome inter-religious strife and work together for ours and our children's common well-being. Thank you.